Hey, Danny, how are you? Ooh, you got your Library of Congress card. That's exciting. Isn't the Library of Congress great? You should go over to the Madison Building because in the in the in the front of the Madison Building they have a mannequin with James Madison's clothing on it, and you recognize just how small he was. Um, it, it always just floors me. Sometimes I go just to see that. Hi, everybody. Raritan, New Jersey, Georgia, Dallas, hot and humid. Um, Texas, I got the wrong, no, I have the right glasses on. Okay, Southeast Michigan, Edmonds, Washington. Welcome aboard, everybody. I'm gonna jump into things, although I'm truly not prepared. I just came, really just came in the door from doing another event, and um, and so I'm dragging a bit. But, um, but, you know, let's do it, right? And I'm off the road now for a couple of weeks, so this should be more regular for a while, at least now. And then I'm back on the road for a month, and then I'm hoping to take most of July and August off of um, travel. I'll continue to write the letters, but I'm hoping to spend a lot of time kayaking. All right, so uh, let me get into some of the stuff you asked about, although as I said, I didn't give you very much time to ask questions. Sorry about that. Uh, I, I want to start in a very general way today with the... Um, the reality that people are more and more and more on edge and the re i'm going to flip this off over here because there's a little ad blinking at me um because there's a lot of stuff going on and a lot of stuff that has been out there simmering is for a long time is is coming to certain conclusions or at least moving very quickly in this moment so of course Ukraine has been um, is in the process of being resupplied with artillery, which protects Ukraine. The, the front line seems to have stabilized, and that's putting pressure, of course, on Russia. And Russia is making all sorts of noises about what it's going to do next, including destabilizing uh, governments in Europe and, and in, the, in North America. You know, so that's going on. And there's also the on again, off again war in the Middle East and who's doing what there. And then, of course, we have the situation here in America with the United States of America with Donald Trump actually being at a criminal trial right now. And that, too, is unsettling. At the same time, we have the campus protests going on. We got the we got spring and summer coming on. And of course, we're going into an election season. So I'm saying all that to start with the idea that do try and ground yourself somewhere you know i look at the the comments that i get from people and how frightened people are and that is not illegitimate to be frightened about what might happen in the future but there is still time to change that future and so rather than sort of being panicked about what comes next now is the time to understand what comes next and how things are moving take deep breaths and still act in ways that can change that future so for example one of the things people still ask me about all the time is Project 2025 and the accompanying um, uh, Agenda 47 that, uh, that it provides an outline for a future Trump presidency. And Project 2025 is definitely something to be concerned about. It's almost a thousand pages. It is put together by the Heritage um, it used to be the Heritage Foundation. Now it's just Heritage, I believe, and in and thirty other right-wing organizations. And it is a blueprint for a future Trump, or uh, Trump presidency, or an administration like someone like Donald Trump. So it's a right-wing uh, blueprint for the future. That being said, it says exactly what you would expect it to. It marries the old idea of. Uh, movement conservative Republicans, uh, the idea that they want essentially libertarian economic policies, the idea they don't want government regulation of business, they don't want a social safety net or the taxes that that would require, they don't want public, found, uh, public funding of infrastructure, and they certainly don't want protection of civil rights. That's all in Project 2025. But there is, in addition in it, uh, the rise of authoritarianism or the cementing of authoritarianism and the insertion of the a theocracy. So one of the big things that Trump has said he would do and that Project 2025 picks up on is the destruction of our nonpartisan civil service. What does that mean? That means that there's, I think it's about 2 million people in the U.S. civil service. And those are the people who uh, run run the the IRS and who run agencies and who you know take care of the sort of bureaucracy of our government and 
in beginning in 1883, after the assassination of James Garfield by a disappointed office seeker who had really quite profound uh, mental health issues aside from that, he's actually a really interesting character, uh, Charles Guiteau. Um, the, the Congress was so horrified at the idea that an actual man was assassinated, a president was assassinated based on the idea that somebody wanted a job, that they passed the Pendleton Act, also known as the Civil Service Act in 1883. And what that did is it said that you 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 did not get your job based on what political party you supported, but instead you would get a political job or a government job based in your skills. So you had to take a, a, um, a, a test to make sure you could read and do basic math and the sorts of skills that one needed in whatever position to which you were applying. So if you're interested actually in the rise of civil service, there is a character from Tammany Hall, which is the machine that runs New York in the late 19th century. And his name is George Washington Plunkett. And I'm actually at the wrong at the wrong um, shelf, bookshelves where I could pull this off my shelf. And you can Google this. George Washington Plunkett ran, uh, ran Tammany Hall. And he does a series of interviews with a newspaper man in which he talks about how terrible the civil service is because what really cements people to uh, uh, government is getting paid by it, basically. And he's all about corruption and why corruption is a good thing. He's the guy from whom we get that quote, I saw I saw my chances and I took them. Um, anyway, if you're interested in the civil service, George Washington Plunkett is somebody who is against the idea of civil service. But most Americans liked the idea of a nonpartisan civil service. And once we got the rise really in the, the late 20th century, the mid 20th century, of the modern day democratic state that we have now that does so many things, the civil service expanded dramatically. And when that happened, it does something really crucial for a democratic government. And that is that that big bevy there, I always think of them as ballast in a ship, to be honest, of people who do their jobs and they don't care if the president is a Republican or a Democrat, they, they vote, but their jobs are nonpartisan, even if they're working for the government. They provide ballast so that you don't get a, a government that swings wildly in one direction or another, or that starts to privilege one partisan point of view over another. And Trump got incredibly frustrated during his term that the nonpartisan civil servants around him in the Justice Department, for example, but elsewhere as well, stood against the policies that he was trying to enact. And so he has vowed to do something that he began to do at the end of his first term, and that is to convert the majority of our civil servants into something called Schedule F, is in the letter Frank, Schedule F employees. And those are, it's a, there's a little bit of a longer story here, but for our purposes right now, those are employees who can be hired or fired based on their political affiliation. So there are always a few of those jobs, about 4,000 of them when Trump first came into office, that are appointed by a president on a partisan basis. But most of the jobs in the civil service are nonpartisan. He wants to take the vast majority of those jobs and flip them into Schedule F. And I keep, I keep emphasizing that word because you often see articles about Schedule F and you're probably like, what is Schedule F? That's what Schedule F is. Anybody who's classified as a, as a, as a Schedule F employee, as it is being defined under the, the people who follow Trump, could be fired at will and could be replaced bipartisan employees and they they figure that they can get rid of most of the nonpartisan civil service that way why does that matter because it means that instead of doing what is in the books what seems to be best for the agency what seems to be best for the american people they will carry out the orders of the president exactly the orders of the president Every civil servant does, in fact, have to follow the executive orders of a president the same way that you have to follow your boss's orders, but that's different than, than basically being politically loyal to them. So Project 2025 has in it the idea of decimating the civil service and replacing it with loyalists, but that also, um, that idea of having loyalists in the government has two other really important prongs to it. One is that Trump wants to have control over the military so that his loyalists will be in the military. 
And he tried to do this at the end of his first uh, his term, if you will. I'm not going to say first because I hope there isn't a second. But the idea right now, of course, is that all branches, all official branches of the military, with the exception of Homeland Security, which is a very new department in the government. It started under George W. Bush, and it does not have the norms and traditions that the other branches of the military have. Those other branches of the military have their own histories, their own rules. They are very firmly fixed on the idea of accountability and of rules. Um, and they have a history in which they have, for example, uh, agreed the 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 army is bound by what's known as the Posse Comitatus Act of 1878, which says that the army won't train, won't, won't turn against American civilians. The other branches of the military are not covered by the Posse Comitatus Act, although they have bound themselves to it. So they have these ways in which they have said they would not carry out illegal rules from a, from a president because they have their own loyalty to that institution and their own sense, their own oaths, their own sense of pride, and so on. Um, Trump wants to get rid of all that. So he would take the military and put his own people in it so that they would do whatever he said, because as he says, as the president, he has ultimate authority. They can do whatever they want. There is also the problem of the Justice Department. And the Justice Department, it's really, really important that the Justice Department does not answer to the president. So in the Justice Department, the president is not supposed to get involved. Um, the president appoints um, a t district attorneys for, I'm, not, I'm sorry, uh, U.S. attorneys. It appoints, uh, the president appoints the attorney general, but then they're supposed to keep their hands off. Now, obviously, Trump did not do that in office. He used the Justice Department to go after James Comey and his deputy uh, director of the FBI as well and tried to use the Justice Department to go after Hillary Clinton and after um, Hunter Biden, of course, and so on. But that's not supposed to happen. And similarly, the FBI, which is part of the Justice Department, is supposed to be independent of everybody. It's the, I think it's the only appointed position in the government that has a 10-year term as opposed to something that is, that can be replaced on the same, um, the same, schedule as things that are two-year terms, right? So um, so they're not, they're always supposed to be um, more than one presidential uh, um, term. So that even if you have an eight-year term, the, the FBI director is supposed to last another two years. Now, of course, Trump fired FBI director James Comey and, and changed that schedule. And that's why we still have Chris Ray in there, Christopher Ray in there, who is a Trump appointee. So the Project 2025 calls both for the, the original project of getting rid of government regulation and um, a social safety net and civil rights and infrastructure. It then it goes to, uh, ahead and has a whole um, plan for the consolidation of power in a very powerful president. But it doesn't stop there. It's got yet one other piece, and that other piece is the imposition of a certain kind of Christian theology on Americans. So it calls for abortion bans. It calls for the end of no-fault divorce. It calls for the end of LGBTQ plus rights. It calls for um, funding um, religious education. It calls for creating a, um, a religious state in the United States, which is really quite antithetical to what the what the Republicans believed between 1981 and 2021, in that they wanted a very small government. Project 2025 calls for a big government that can do things like police, LGBTQ plus Americans, and so on. So those three things are in this um, this Project 2025, and in that it looks very much like the government of. Um, Viktor Orban in Hungary, who overthrew democracy to make himself an autocrat with the idea of um, he got people to vote for him. On, he was actually in power twice, but the second time around by emphasizing immigration and has put in place what he calls illiberal or Christian democracy, which is different than the Christian Democrat Party in, in, in Germany, for example. And um, and he has done so in order to consolidate power into his own hands. And that's, um, that's, it is no accident that that's the blueprint for Project 2025 because Heritage, where I started all this, 
um, works very closely with the Danube Institute, which is in Hungary and is the works hand in hand with the Orban government. All right, so that may be more than you um, um, wanted to know about Project 2025, but that's, uh, that is definitely out there and it's definitely very concerning because that's what the current Republicans would like to put in place. I just saw somebody is um, concerned about my empty bookshelves. They're new. But remember, I have bookshelves elsewhere that are, I'm, I'm actually in Massachusetts today. My main bookshelves are still full of my phenomenal collection, well, of lots of books, but of the, um, I collect first edition 19th century political biographies. And that's what you see behind me in Maine. They're, they're generally first editions from the 19th century. Nobody seems to care about those books. So they're really inexpensive, um, but they're cheap, much cheaper than a modern day uh, hardcover, by the way. But I, I quite love them. Um, actually, last night when I wrote about uh, the Chinese Ex uh, Exclusion Act, it was killing me because there was a quotation from William Henry Seward that I wanted, but it's in my, it's in, it's on those bookshelves and not on these bookshelves. So they weren't there. Um, uh, all right. So, so don't worry. I'm not like moving out or anything. It's just that I haven't moved in yet in a way. Um, and actually not here, but in, in Maine, I have, um, a whole bookshelf full of books that I'm aiming to read or that are for the new book that I'm writing. So that's kind of cool. All right, so um, so that's Project 2025. And I threw that out there because people are very, very worried about Project 2025. And they're very wor worried about Agenda 47, which is sort of a streamlined version of what they want Trump to do. And mind you, this is not necessarily Trump who's gonna be doing this. Trump cares about his brand and money and being powerful. Those are the things he cares about. The pieces of this are from his, um, the, the people around him. Steve Bannon, for example, or um, Steve Miller, he used to call them my two Steves, um, and the, the many other people who, um, who are um, uh, uh, helping to prepare for a future potential Trump presidency. Now, I wanted to throw that out there because that's there for sure, but, and this is a big but. This is, that's very concerning in any number of ways. Um, and I don't, I, believe me, I'm not denigrating that. And and these are these are very important things. And, and I'm, I, uh, I wanna talk about that too, hold on. Um, um, but this is not a foregone conclusion. I mean, this is one of the things that, and I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm very tired and I didn't have a lot of notes here, so I'm going to riff a little bit. You know, if you, if you know Faulkner's work, William Faulkner, um, uh, he has an, I mean, he's a great American writer, but he has this book called Absalom, Absalom. And one of the main points of that book, it's a very powerful book and, a, and important in my life, is that he, he talks about really how the present changes the past which you think, you know, I just said that and you're probably like, okay, she's lost it. But his point, although he puts it much better than I will in this book, is that what happens in the future changes the way we see what happened in the past. So for example, if we go forward from this moment and we codify Roe versus Wade into law and we, we, and we American women once again, ha have live in a world that recognizes the constitutional right to abortion, we will look at the period between June 2022 and whenever that happens as this crazy blip of, you know, reactionary politics that took away a fundamental right. If instead the abortion bans possible because of Dobbs stay on the books for the, the future, people in 30 years will look back at the period of Roe versus Wade from 1973 to 2022 as the blip. So the future really does change the past because of the way we understand the past. So um, when I talk about Project 2025, that could be our future. Or it could be something that historians teach in 60 years to say, wow, look how wacko they got. And there was this weird thing that, that they wrote and then it never got put into effect. And right now we get to choose which of those two things are gonna be. So I'm not gonna do, to say you shouldn't worry about Project 2025, but it's not a done deal. So the other thing that I really wanted to make sure I talked about today was the fact that, that the Republican Party 
and its current leader, uh, former President Donald Trump, are in utter disarray. They are in complete disarray. So let's start with Trump. Trump is presents himself, or in the past has presented himself, as a dominant figure. His dominance, his displays of dominance, his shouting people down, his attacks on women and minorities, his um, his refusal to pay contractors, his bluster, his insistence that his inauguration was bigger than Barack Obama's, when we could see with our own eyes it was not. All of that is performative dominance politics. And it's served him very well throughout his career. But right now, it's not working. Right now, the man is in a criminal trial in New York, and it's not going very well to the point that, um, you know, Trump seems increasingly unhinged and he is having to do what the judge, uh, Juan Mershan, tells him to, stand up, sit down, do this, don't do that. Um, and he is unable to control his outbursts in, in um, such a way that he is, uh, has been actually threatened with jail time. And he is, uh, he, he doesn't look dominant when, when he is sitting, having to listen to people trash him um, and, and have receipts for what was certainly looks from what we have seen so far, like a criminal enterprise, that really hurts his invincible brand, first of all. So even if it were just that, I would look at that and I would say, He's got some issues here. He's got nobody sitting with him unless they can make Eric come in. Um, and he he doesn't look dominant anymore. And that's always been his big thing. And he's never had to deal with a situation where he's not dominant because he always had the money or the power to be able to reinforce his dominance. And now he can't do that because he's in a court of law, right? He, he And the judge calls him out and says, You're, this is not true what you just said, and you may not do this. And so that right there itself is a problem, but I'm not done yet. He's not done with, with court cases and he's already had uh, more than half a billion dollars in um, disgorgement and penalties assessed on him in two ways in which he has been found guilty. Um, both the fraud and of defamation uh, of E. Jean Carroll in two cases with E. Jean Carroll and then the writer E. Jean Carroll who, um, whom he sexually assaulted and was found liable for rape in, um, in a, a dressing room in New York, I think in the 1980s, and then the, the, the fraud company involving him, his two oldest sons, two employees of the Trump Organization and the Trump Organization itself. So he's got these real major court cases as well. So he's got that going on just personally. But then he's got the problem of money. He's in real trouble financially, like real trouble financially. And remember, it's the fraud case um, that in the fraud case, one of the things that they that they uh, that, that the judge said has been proven is that um, he would borrow money based on inflated valuations of his properties, but then lower those values when it came for taxes. And that's, of course, what people like me pay attention to because, you know, I like taxes. I love to study taxes. But um, who says I'm a nerd? But, um, but imagine that. Imagine inflating the value of properties when you go to get loans. Well, what does that mean? What does that mean? It means that if you have a two hundred and fifty thousand dollar house and you tell the bank that it's worth five million and you borrow based on five million, but the house is still really only worth two hundred and fifty thousand dollars, you're in a you're in a problem. You've borrowed money that you cannot pay back unless you can leverage all the many other things he does. So. There's a money problem, first of all, with the, the huge amounts of, of um, um, appeals bonds he's had to put up, but also because even though he seems short on money there, he still has to run his business. That's not cheap. And he, um, he still has to run for president, which is also not cheap. So what he has done then is if he's got the, problem, the problems personally, and he's got the problems financially and not in, in, the, in the, the criminal problems as well. What he's done is he's taken over the Republican National Committee. Now, what that means is that 
He has taken a long-standing institution that used to be used to elect Republicans to, uh, to elected office in general, and he's taken it over and he's changed the terms of how money goes into it so that he gets first crack at the money. Both his, his, um, his uh, campaign for president and his legal bills get first crack at the money. So if you are a down-ballot candidate, that is, you're not running for president, you're in real trouble because he's soaking up all that money and he's soaking up the money not only through the RNC, but also by continually tapping out small donors. And he had got tons of small donors in 2016 and that's really drying up. Somebody, you know, I love the stuff people send me and somebody sent me in one day within the last few days, they'd gotten 40 solicitations from the Trump people for money. Well, 40, if you're sending out 40 solicitations for money in a single day, you're hurting, right? Or else you're really stupid about marketing. So there is, there is that problem for the Republican Party. And there's also the problem for the Republican Party that if you're in a down ballot race, they've already said to you, you're not gonna get any money. So if you wanna be elected to Congress, you've got yourself a big problem because you've got the Republican Party basically saying, hey, you're on your own, which may not matter if you're a well-known Senator, but if you're in the House of Representatives or if you wanna be in the House of Representatives, all of a sudden your institutional support, which by the way, has been there for, for decades and decades and decades is essentially gone. So you are basically on your own. So what does that mean? That means in part that you're going to develop your own basis of support, but also that you very well might not like the, the people like Donald Trump and his supporters who've done this to you. So let's go the next step back from that. And that is, um, is the Republican Party. Because the Republican Party in 2016 is an entirely different kettle of fish than it is today. So in 2016, when Trump comes onto the scene, it's those old movement conservatives who wanna get rid of business regulation, get rid of the social safety net, make the government as small as possible, and basically just funnel money upward as they had been doing since 1981. Remember, about $53 trillion have gone from the bottom 90% of Americans up to the, the top 1%. So that's what they want. But Trump recognizes that the process of he's a salesman right he's always been a great salesman he recognizes that in the process of doing that though that legislation has has they've gotten people to turn that that legislation has hollowed out the middle class and Republican leaders have gotten people to vote for them by really hammering on racism and sexism, on you know racist tropes about minority Americans taking tax dollars and women killing babies, you know, the, the, um, the anti-abortion movement. So that's what he really doubles down on. And what he manages to do during his term is to turn that populist base of the Republican party into the leadership of the base and the the leadership of the party and the the old leaders people like Mitch McConnell still continue to think that they're going to be able to control those people and one of the reasons that McConnell lets Trump go on the second impeachment trial is because he thinks he's going to go away but of course Trump doesn't go away and he puts those people at the head of the party so those are the MAGA Republicans and those are the ones like Marjorie Taylor Greene and Lauren Boebert and Mike Johnson and you know all those uh, um, Jim Jordan all the, the guys who supported the January 6th attempt to overturn the results of the the presidential election and in 2020 and those people are ideologically extreme they don't want the federal government they do want religion they don't want the secular government that we have had in our country forever they want to replace it with a religious government and they're willing to do a number of things to make that happen that simply horrify the businessmen on the on in the the movement conservative wing of the party so for example by threatening to not to raise the debt ceiling for the United States of America, that literally would have crashed the entire global economy and the United States never would have recovered its seat at, at, the, at the, the head of the table of international um, affairs because nobody could trust us again. We would have ripped the bottom out of everything and it would have created an, an, I mean, a, a huge depression. And they simply didn't even understand that, let alone, I mean, some people said, well, we need a correction and it's like, you don't rip, I mean, literally just rip the bottom out of everything, you know, so that airplanes can't fly and so on. And similarly, when they 
keep threatening to shut down the government or when they were refusing to um, to put money behind Ukraine's uh, defense of its Ukrainians defense of their country against the invasion uh, the second invasion of Vladimir Putin um, it, I mean anybody who knew anything about foreign affairs knows that Putin must be stopped even Republicans even those old guard Republicans but what that's done is the fight between the MAGA Republicans and the former movement Republicans means that you've gotten a real exodus from the House of Representatives, especially of those older movement conservative Republicans and a Congress that has been one of the most ineffectual um, co uh, Congresses in American history because of how pathetic the House of Representatives is. So essentially, the, the Republican Party has just been tearing itself apart with the different sides screaming at each other, including in public Chip Roy, who's an extremist yelling at the um, at the movement conservatives, you know, show them, show me one thing we've done here. Well, he was right. But um, so so you've got the Republicans very bitterly divided and fighting amongst themselves. You've got the leader of the party. Um, uh, falling apart and desperate for money so much that he's destroying the, the, the apparatus of the party itself. And altogether, you know, you look at that and you absolutely should be worried about Project 2025. But, oh my God, we've never seen a Republican Party look like this. And the, 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 they cer we certainly have had times when we have had um, the party both parties, I'm sort of picking on the Republicans now because the other thing that looks somewhat like this is when Harding takes office in 1920, the Republicans have been accustomed to being the party of no under Woodrow Wilson. And all of a sudden they're in power and they don't know what to do. So they just start fighting and they turn everything over to um, to the Harding administration and then to the Coolidge administration. And that's where we get the takeover of the um, the apparatus of the government by businessmen, because basically they say, we'll just turn it all over to the businessmen because we don't know what we're doing. Um, and I paraphrase, but that's the gist of it. Anyway, so the Republicans are in just complete disarray. Um, the So so what is the other side of that? The, um, um, the um, I must have said the, the wrong side. I, 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 I meant that the, the the Republicans in the House of Representatives are the ones that are in complete disarray. They run the House of Representatives. They have a very slight uh, majority. The Democrats are still in, in the Senate. And one of the things that you are, um, are not seeing a lot, I think, in public right now are Democrats stepping up to the mics and people are like, what's going on? Why aren't the Democrats doing anything? And it's worth remembering that Nancy Pelosi is still in Congress. She's no longer the um, House Speaker, but she is still in Congress. And Pelosi was a freaking genius at staying out of the way when the Republicans were fighting amongst themselves. So I think probably part of what you're seeing with the Democrats keeping their mouth shut a lot now is them uh, them not wanting to interrupt, you know, what do they say? Don't interrupt your opponent when they're they're shooting themselves in the feet, which is precisely what it looks like is happening. But there's a couple more things then about what's going on with the Democrats right now. The Democrats are extraordinarily well lined up together. And, and this is a real change. And it's a real change because not for the Democrats necessarily. There's this whole trope about Democrats in disarray, but that's really coming from uh, right-wing media. Um, but the Republicans have been really been in lockstep since the 1990s because of the power of the Fox News Channel and because of the power of Rush Limbaugh. Well, I don't know if you've noticed, but Rush Limbaugh ain't here anymore. And the Fox News Channel has suddenly begun to crumble as its, um, its uh, hosts like Tucker Carlson have um, been been forced off the platform. Now he's isn't he on X or something or whatever. And the um, and the the Fox News Channel has to be a little bit more careful because it's had so many huge settlements against it for lying to its viewers, that um, and for defaming not for lying to its viewers. You can lie to your viewers for defaming um, for defaming people and companies that were involved in the 2020 election. That they're not really giving Republicans. Uh, 
um, marching orders either. So what you're seeing instead on the Republican side is sort of this splintering where, you know, Marjorie Taylor Greene says the most important thing we do is to get rid of Mike Johnson and other Republicans going, would you shut up, Marjorie? And, you know, they don't really have a message. The Democrats, in contrast, have been able to turn out unanimous votes or majority votes losing votes they don't need, just in case you don't know that. Um, if, if, the, if the party in, that is gonna win a vote has enough votes, that's the time when a majority or a, a, the, the party leader will say to someone who needs to, um, to somebody like Jared Golden in Maine, who's got a very conservative base, um, he can the 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 majority leader will say we don't need your vote vote however you want, but so often people are like why did that person vote that way? It if their vote isn't needed, that's a way to sort of bring every keep everybody behind the party. It's not a you can look at it as a bad thing, but it can also be a good thing because it means that people feel represented, even if um, if a party measure goes through that they might not like. But the Democrats have again and again and again for the last three years now gotten legislation that they wanted, even though the House of Representatives is currently controlled by MAGA Republicans. It is truly astonishing, the, the list of things that the Democrats have gotten. Now, they haven't gotten everything they wanted. They didn't get things that were very important to me. They didn't get the, um, the, the second half of the infrastructure bill that they wanted, the Build Back Better plan that focused on the care economy. Um, and they didn't get... Um, and they didn't get, am I still here? I am, I can't believe that my whole thing just went dark. Uh, and they didn't get voting rights legislation, which to me was number one and number everything. But, um, but I'll say more about that in just a minute. But the Democrats have been extraordinarily on message. So one of the things you keep hearing is that, well, we don't hear from the Democrats, but in fact, we do hear from the Democrats. Now they don't get much legacy press which is just bon just bizarre, I think. Just just weird how little coverage you see in legacy media of what the White House is doing and of what Vice President Kamala Harris is doing because what they what let's start with Harris. What she is doing is she has been um traveling around the country now for years, not just for weeks or months, but years talking to young people about reproductive rights, and about gun safety, um, common sense gun safety legislation. She is a freaking rock star to young people. They turn out, they literally turn out cheering for her. And, and the, the thing about Harris is, you know, she's extraordinarily smart. I used to watch her when she was in the Senate just to watch her shape arguments because it was so freaking cool to watch her the way she could shape space with words, really. Um, you know, think Tommy Tuberville, man. Um, so she's very, very smart. She's very personable. She's very kind. Um, but she's a vice president and vice presidents tend to be ignored. Like what, how many things can you mention that a vice president has done while in office? Because they're supposed to be invisible. They're supposed to stay out of the limelight. They get their own portfolios with luck. That's in another country as much of Harris's was. And they, um, their job is not to be visible. And people feel very conflicted about vice presidents in general because they only become really important if there's a tragedy. So actually in American history, the, the usual step into the presidency was not through the vice president. It was through the secretary of state. It was secretaries of state who became president more often than vice presidents. So, um, so for, for all that she doesn't seem to be very visible, certainly in the press, she's very visible to young Americans and they adore her. So if you, if you watch some of the videos of her going to college campuses, it's like she's a rock star and they're screaming and they're, you know, for vice president. So, um, so you're not seeing a lot of that in the legacy media, but it's absolutely there. And well, Harris is really focused on reproductive rights and the right to equal treatment before the law. So she is the first person who rushed down to Tennessee when the Tennessee 
uh, Justin's, the Tennessee three got in trouble with the um, Tennessee legislature, but it was the two young black men who got kicked out of the legislature. She was there that night and she really has emphasized the right to equality before the law and reproductive freedoms. And they're talking a lot about reproductive freedoms. Um, on the, in, in contrast to that, Biden has, and, and by the way, those are the two things that matter most. Well, the, the top thing that matters most to young Americans is abortion rights. The second thing is gun safety legislation. And then the third is civil rights. So she's, she's out there talking about that. Biden is out there talking about the economy and working on the economy. So again, unfortunately, this has gotten very little play in the legacy press. But what the Biden administration has done is the stuff you've heard about. The American Rescue Plan, which gave us the best recovery after the, the worst of the COVID pandemic of any country in the world. We have this incredible economy right now. I'll talk more about that in a second. But so we had the American Rescue Plan. We've got the Chips and Science Act, which has invested a huge amount of money in the construction of um, new factories to, to make um, uh, uh, computer chips and to do scientific research. We've got the Inflation Reduction Act, which invests an enormous amount of money in climate change, something also that's important to all of us, but certainly to young voters. We've got the, the Bipartisan Infrastructure Act, which is rebuilding our, our bridges and is so popular that Republicans who voted against it are taking credit for the projects that are coming home with it. Um, so, so we have all these different ways in which there's been legislation that is helping to rebuild the country and to create new jobs. But we also have the fact that under Trump, I'm sorry, Biden's appointee, Lena Khan, the FTC, the Federal Trade Commission, has been pushing back against um, junk fees that businesses have been putting in place on tickets, on airplanes, on, um, on rental cars. I've talked about that before, and that really matters to people. They have also, thanks to the Inflation Reduction Act, been able to negotiate with pharmaceutical companies about the price of very popular drugs. So they have brought down insulin, for example, and capped it at 35 bucks a week. Um, for it was at first just for the the companies that worked with Medicare, but it also a number of them have also jumped on board because of the pressure from that that change. And now, of course, they're negotiating with a whole with ten different um, over ten different drugs with pharmaceutical companies. And thanks to Khan at the FTC, the they are taking on. Um, what are called junk patents. So one of the big problems with the drug prices in the United States is that pharmaceutical companies claim that there, there's something unique about their drug and they list them as being protected by patent, but they're really not that different than anything else. So Khan began to challenge those and she's been winning. That's why if you use an asthma inhaler, that's why those are $35 now. And, um, and she just began to challenge, I think it's a hundred more of them, although it might be more than that this last week. So um, so there are all sorts of ways in which they are trying to make the economy fair, fairer than it was, than it began to be in 1981 when the Reagan administration began to cut regulation, business regulations and crucially it, uh, embrace the concept that Robert Bork, that Robert Bork put forward that said that mega combinations are fine so long as they bring prices back down for the, com the consumers. So it doesn't matter if it hurts the environment. It doesn't matter if it hurts um, unions. It doesn't, none of that matters so long as it brings prices down in the short term. And what that gave us, of course, was a lot of monopolies, which again, the FTC has taken on Apple and Microsoft and all that to try and make things fairer for people who want to start companies and for consumers as well. Um, so like there's one, there's a bunch of new apps you can get on your Apple phone. And one of the reasons for that is they're trying to say, hey, look, we can play nice after all. Um, so Biden has been emphasizing that and that has um, not gotten a lot of traction in the legacy press. And a lot of people always come back and say, wait a minute, wait a minute. The economy doesn't look that good to me because inflation has been high. Now we know, of course, that much of the inflation has come from price gouging of these big corporations. But also, here's a really important statistic, and that is that um, if you are in the bottom 80% of Americans, the bottom 80%, your wages 
have outpaced inflation. So you are objectively doing better. You've got more money in your pocket. And you can see this through any of the graphs. But if you're in the top 20%, the opposite is true. Your pay has not increased faster than inflation. So you've actually lost some ground over the past three years, but the bottom 80 has gained ground. So what Biden is doing is restoring that compression that we had between 1933 and 1981 that meant there was much less of a gap between the very wealthy and the very poor. And of course, one of the things he would like very much to do is to increase taxes on the very wealthy. And that's people who make more than $400,000 a year. So, and, and it overwhelmingly will hit, of course, billionaires, but they actually pay less now. The statistic, the, the thing changed uh, about two weeks ago. They pay less in taxes now than people below them. They pay a lower percentage rate, not, not less. They pay a lower percentage rate than people below them. And this, I think, is one of the reasons that very wealthy people are supporting Trump is because if you increase taxes on that group, uh, the taxes that were lowered under Trump in 2017 and, and in, by George W. Bush, we're talking billions of dollars that will come out of their pockets. Now, people like me think that considering the fact that between 1981 and, and 2021, uh, about $53 trillion went from the bottom 90% to the top 1%, it's okay to bring it back down personally. But that's what Biden has been trying to do. Now, one of the other things that you that nobody talks about, but I'm playing around with these days, is if you look at where we're getting all these new um, companies, and by the way, those are companies that are not paid for exclusively by public money, but also by private investment. If you look at where they are, many of them are in Republican-dominated states and Republican-dominated areas. Uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene's uh, district in Georgia got a new, I think it was a solar company. And I find this fascinating because I know a lot of people are like, why give them any money? They all want to secede. I think, and I'm, that's, I'm paraphrasing there. Um, I think that Biden has actually been working to break the disaffection among those Republicans who have, have had their way of life hollowed out since 1981. That is, the sexism and the racism and the hatred that you're seeing amongst that base um, began, of course, I mean, it was always there, but it really took off as, as they recognized that they were falling behind economically. And I think Biden is kind of stepping in there with government money and saying, government really can work for you. And there was this moment in Michigan within the last week where uh, a right-wing person was up there talking about how Biden had destroyed the economy and Trump would bring back manufacturing. And the host on the show actually said, wait a minute, we lost manufacturing jobs under Trump and we have gained, I want to say it was, I want to say it was 47,000, but I don't remember off the top of my head, but we have gained thousands and thousands of jobs under Biden. So don't try and tell us that this hasn't been good for us because, of course, Michigan has the, the auto industry in it. And Biden has been very good about really standing behind the UAW, for example, the union. So I think that that is, um, if you look at where we are right now, um, there's a lot of sort of big picture stuff moving and all the frustrations and the stuff spraying at us all the time kind of makes us miss seeing the big picture. And the big picture is one in which you've got a society that is changing really dramatically from a way of life, the, what's called the neoliberalism concept uh, from 1981 to 2021, to a new version of the kind of society that we had between the New Deal of 1933 and 1981, that use the federal government to help ordinary Americans. And that's going to be really painful, and it's not going to turn around overnight. This is 40 years of, of change that are being compressed here and turning around. But I think that's what you're seeing here, and I actually think it's really popular. Um, Biden's in this really weird position of forcing through, sometimes through executive orders, measures that Americans like. I mean, usually in the past, executive orders, um, certainly under uh, presidents since Reagan, have been used to put through things people don't like. Biden has 
forced through things that have 80% approval rates because the, the Republicans have simply tried to kill legislation in the Congress because they don't want any of this legislation. So, um, so there's a lot of those pieces of things going on. And in just to, to move this forward a little bit, um, um, Oh, somebody's asking here, this is good, Nancy. Uh, does the progressive movement have something comparable to, to Project 2025? So I th here's one of the things I would say, and that's that one of the things that I think is a bit of a problem for the Democrats is that it is much easier to say no to things than it is to say yes to things. And you see this with the House Republicans right now. It's really easy to be elected to Congress and just vote no on everything. You don't have to be informed. You don't have to understand how things work. You can just say no and you can go in front of right wing media and you can say outrageous things and you get clicks and you get invited on talk shows and with luck, you know, people start giving you donations and you can, I don't know, go watch movies. I don't know what one does under those circumstances. But to build things is difficult. And one of the things, you know, as you know, I've been very fortunate to meet a number of people in the Biden administration. They're crazy smart. They're incredibly smart. And I mean that from the top um, to the staffers who are just starting out, just out of college, uh, crackerjack smart people. And the reason I mention that is because you take somebody like Lena Khan, who's incredibly smart, or like um, Gina Raimondo uh, at um, Commerce, or like um, Deb Holland at Interior, um, or certainly Secretary of State Antony Blinken and, and Biden and Harris themselves, um, the work that they are doing is complicated. I mean, you don't sue um, Apple without weeks and months and years of work to put together an argument and a case and so on. And similarly, you don't approve grants without tons and tons of paperwork. And, you know, one of the things that always jumped out to me was after the train derailed in East Palestine in Ohio in, I think it was 2017, don't quote me on that, the Republicans jumped right out in front of the cameras and said, Biden's not doing anything. And you can look, I actually wrote about that a number of times. In fact, the federal government was on site within hours. There were four different teams. They were doing exactly what they were supposed to do. Some were cleaning up, some were doing one thing, some were doing something else. They were interfacing in all sorts of ways. But that's not the kind of work that creates a blueprint. That's the kind of work that says we are in here doing the best we can with the resources we have to try and make things better. And it's much harder to have a blueprint for that. So one of the things I would say about uh, a blueprint on the progressive side, it's funny we call it progressive because to me it's traditional America. Um, you know, the idea that people are created equal and have a right to a say in their government is crazy radical. It was crazy radical in 1776, and it's crazy radical today. To go in, go to most of the countries in the world and say, hey, women should have the same rights as men, or LGBTQ plus people should have the same rights as heteronormative people, or say, you know, uh, Muslims should have the same right as, as Christians, or, you know, and I could go on here, that is an incredibly crazy, radical idea. And for me, the blueprint for the American movement, if you will, those of us who are trying to protect democracy, is simply the Declaration of Independence, that we have a right to be treated equally before the law and everything that comes from that. And we have a right to have a say in our government and everything that comes from that. And we would like our government to do things like protect us from gun violence. And that's, that's not about some distant government. 80% of us would like our children not to have to have active shooter drills. Um, and that's us. That's not, as I say, some distant ideology. That's us. That's our government. So I think in terms of going forward for messaging in this election, you can see that the Democratic leaders, like uh, Vice President Kamala Harris, are using the word freedom a lot.
Personally, I like the word fair. I like the word fairness. And you see Biden using that some. But mostly what they're talking about is, uh, is a government that is not dominated by a very few wealthy people or by um, a certain group of right-wing evangelical white Christians who want to impose their values on the rest of us. So, um, so um, was it really uh, was the, the, the first derailment in East Palestine I thought was in, uh, oh, not 2017. I'm sorry, you're absolutely right. I, I'm, my head is by administration, and I was thinking it was shortly after administration. I'm sorry, you're right about that. East Palestine, 2023. Although I think there were two of them, although I could be wrong on that too. Anyway, um, so, um, uh, so why did, uh, Lisa, you said, why does nobody know what the Biden administration is doing? Okay, I think there's a couple of things going on with that. And that's that, first of all, the U.S. press is in a real crisis. As you know, we've got newspapers shutting every day. I believe it's every week we lose two newspapers. Um, and we have the problem of the fact that newspapers became heavily capitalized over the last several decades, and they need to make money. And that has really pushed them toward the idea of clickbait, the idea that if you can outrage people, the more you can outrage them, the more often they will click on your site. And it's also meant that they have lost the ability to let reporters do really in-depth work. So, um, you know, it's really marked. I don't have a lot of time now to talk to reporters, but I used to love to talk to reporters on background so I could tell them what they needed to know. And it was always really marked to me that for European papers, you would literally get reporters calling and saying, you know, I got a story due in a couple of weeks on, you know, the upcoming convention. And I feel like I don't understand the history of the Senate well enough. Could we just talk for, you know, an hour or so about the history of the Senate? You know, just I'll, I'll put you on record, but I'm not going to use this material. I just want to understand it more. Never got that from an American journalist because they had a deadline and they had to come out with their their um, their piece within a matter of hours. So we've lost that kind of depth. And also, I think um, it's hard to write those stories. So I did write about it when I when the when it happened, I was paying attention and I'm like, what do you mean there's nobody there? I, I've seen people there. But it took me most of the night to look up who was there and why they were there and how the EPA works and how the rapid response teams work and how the different pieces all fit together. And it just takes a lot of time and a lot of work that I think you're seeing amongst independent journalists, people, I'm not a journalist, but people like Judd Legum or people like Joyce White Vance, um, people who, and she's not trained as a journalist either, but people who have the time and the ability to spend many, many hours explaining how things work. And that's one of the reasons I think you're seeing the rise of independent journalists now in this moment, because the legacy media is not covering that. But I also want to, um, to, to go one more step today in the last few minutes I have here. And that is to point out that having just talked to you about Project 2025 and why I think the Republican Party is in real trouble and why I think the Democratic Party is actually quite strong right now, um, what is going on with this election? And the answer to that, I, I would like to point out, you will note that even though people still talk about how they are concerned that Biden is old, which, by the way, is absolutely a product of the degree to which the New York Times ran with the um, the superfluous items in Robert Hur's report about Biden's um, retention of classical of uh, classified documents while he was vice president. Um, Biden's on the road every single day. And you can watch this, by the way. You, 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 this, I don't have any secret information here. You literally can go to whitehouse.gov and it will give you his schedule and say, you know, here's he, he's here, he's here, he's here. He's giving multiple speeches every day. He's also, so he's traveling all over the country doing that. While Trump, even if he is not on trial, has just been golfing and staying at Mar-a-Lago. And that's a really important contrast there. And you hear Trump complaining that he can't, campaign because he's in this trial. But when he has days off, he doesn't go on the road, partly because he doesn't have the money to go on the road, partly because I just don't think he's got the stamina to do that. He also is an older man. He's 77 and he's not in anywhere near the physical condition that Biden is. So um, 
it's well that that contrast is not getting a lot of publicity it's definitely there biden is absolutely out and around and and the vice president is is as well um is is constantly out meeting people talking to people so there is that going on but there is also something that i think speaks to that or that it speaks to and that is i've said this to you before i do not think that donald trump is trying to win this election that is if he wanted to win this election by getting people to vote for him, he would have reached out to Nikki Haley voters. He's absolutely not done so. He has said, we do not need Nikki Haley voters. Well, we know he doesn't have a majority. So if you were running for office, and in the past, everybody who want, ran for office who wanted to win, we have occasionally had presidents who did not want to win. Um, in, in a, this is a digression for sure. Um, do you care? Maybe you don't care. We we did we did in fact have an election um, in the 1860s, 1868, when the Democrat didn't even want to run. I mean, he was the head of the Democratic Party. They couldn't find somebody to run uh, to run as president, and they put him on the ticket. And he literally said, "I do not want to run for president." So he made a really half-hearted attempt to you know to. But anyway, that's a bit of a rabbit hole. Anyway. Um, Anybody who actually runs for office and wants to win tries to get voters. They get out on the road, not just to their bases. They, it's no good to talk to your base. you got to get to the people who are not quite convinced to follow you yet. He could reach out to the Nikki Haley voters. He could do it, and he's not doing it. So what is he trying to do? And here's what I am looking at and very concerned about in 2024. And that is, if you look at the way Trump is talking, and if you look at the way his surrogates are talking, people like Carrie Lake in Arizona, they are urging supporters to become violent and to challenge people at the voting booths. So why does that matter? It matters because, and you can actually look at this if you want, um, if you remember in 2020, the real plan with before January, the, the attack of January 20, 20, uh, January 6, 2021, the real plan was to get the Congress to reject certifying or counting. They were already certified to reject the counting of electoral votes and to throw that decision about who was going to become president into the House of Representatives, which under the 12th Amendment of the Constitution, the House of Representatives, if, if nobody makes it to 270 votes, the House of Representatives uh, decides, uh, and each state there gets one vote. So a Republican-dominated state like, say, Wyoming would have as much of a say as a Democratic state like California. Now, California has, I think it's 43 million people. Wyoming has 900,000, but they're this, or, or about, thereabouts. This is all off the top of my head. But they're equal under the 12th Amendment in the House of Representatives. And I look at that, and I look at their calls to violence, and I look at what seems to be an attempt to create real confusion over the results of the election. And I worry a lot that they're going to try and throw it into the House of Representatives, which by our constitution is the institution that is supposed to decide who is going to be president if nobody gets to the number that they need to under the Electoral College. And that, um, that I think is worth being very aware of. And one of the reasons that I am, am traveling the country trying to urge people to turn out, because this, this even if you're in a Republican dominated state, this needs to be a really clear election. And, um, and the numbers have to be very obvious that, that Trump did not win this election. And, and the reason that uh, more evidence for worrying about this is that um, yesterday, last night, quite late last night, California Representative Zoe Lofgren, who was on the uh, January 6th committee, special committee, released the media files of all the members of the House of Representatives who... Um, who voted not to certify the results of the election. And especially in, Mob it's very long, it's more than 1,300 pages, but they're very easy to read if you're so inclined. Um, they don't really have to read them. I mean, they're tweets mostly and, and Facebook page co uh, uh, collections. Um, um, 
Mo Brooks especially, who, was, who spoke at the Ellipse on January 6, repeatedly talks about throwing the election to the House of Representatives. And we know that that was part of the plan. So what I have described for you here is real concern about what Project 2025 has set out to do, why it seems like a pretty big stretch to think that the, the Republicans are running in a very good position right now, why the Democrats are in fact running in a good position. Oh, and somebody's gonna say, well, what about um, young people in the protests? Um, the, they are getting a ton of press right now, but in terms of politics, uh, the, the caring about the Middle East is way at the bottom of the list young people care about. I mean, it's way at the bottom of the list. So I say gun safety, abortion, and civil rights are at the very top, um, all of which the, the mix drives them toward Biden and toward Harris. And, and that's what we're seeing in the poll, in the, in the, the, um, the topic polls, which you can believe, as opposed to the people polls, which you can't. Um, and uh, so I've talked about why the, the Republicans look weak and the Democrats look strong, but this seems to me to be the big elephant in the room. This attempt to create so much mud around the election that it goes to the House of Representatives. And if that happens, all bets are off. Um, it, it, it will go to whether the House delegations, which of course have been partisan gerrymandered in Republican dominated states, to the point that they, even though they're, some of them are 50 50 states like North Carolina, Democrats cannot get a majority of. Um, of the delegation because of the gerrymandering. That's what I'm watching going forward and why I would urge you uh, really to focus on house races and, um, and state races, uh, state races that can be contested. And the Democrats have been very aggressive in this cycle to contest as many races as they possibly can. But I would urge you to, to really push, even run for office yourself, to see if you can at least disrupt some of the House district races that might not otherwise have been um, have gotten paid attention to. So, for example, in his first election, Mike Johnson ran unopposed, and that I think is absolutely worth watching going forward in 2024. So, all that to be said, I um, um, I um, urge you not to 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 waste too much emotional energy and all the details right now. There's going to be a lot coming at us all the time. The other thing I would really urge you to do is take a deep breath. You know, I, I sat here the other day trying to figure out what's going on in the Middle East, and I read 40 stories, 20 of which said the, there was going to be a ceasefire, 20 of which said there was never going to be a ceasefire. And the bottom line was nothing had happened yet. And I thought, what a waste of everybody's time and energy because everyone's just guessing at this point. I can wait until something actually happens and then I can worry about it. But right now, sitting here in my house, I got no control over whether it's going to go forward or whether it's not. So don't lose a lot of angst over stuff we don't control yet. Take time, try and, and pace yourself going forward, but recognize that for all that there is very great reason to be concerned about Project 2025 um, and the other things that go along with that, nothing is a done deal. You know, the future remains unwritten and we're the ones who get to write it. So anyway, on that note, um, I'm going to let you go and I'm going to do something. I don't know. Um, start to write at the very least. Thanks for being here.